Al Capone is one of the most popular gangsters ever. I came to Chicago with $40 in my pocket. My son is now 12. I'm still married and I love my wife dearly. This notorious gangster, also known as Scarface Al, led a life of crime and luxury in Chicago during the 1920s and 30s. However, when he arrived at Alcatraz in 1934, his life took a dramatic turn. From his transfer to Alcatraz as prisoner 85, to his model behavior as a prisoner to his battle with syphilis, Capone's story is filled with unexpected twists. Let's get to it. Al Capone's Prison Life Al Capone, the notorious gangster known as Scarface Al, was a name that struck fear into the hearts of Americans during the 1920s and 30s. He was public enemy number one, the face of organized crime in Chicago. But in late August of 1934, Capone's life took a drastic turn when he arrived at the infamous Alcatraz, a federal maximum security prison located on a rocky island in San Francisco Bay. Alcatraz had just opened its doors a few weeks before Capone's arrival, and it was considered all but escape-proof. Capone, who had been serving his sentence in Atlanta for tax evasion was transferred to Alcatraz with more than 100 other prisoners from across the United States. It was an unusual choice to send Capone to Alcatraz, considering he was a white-collar criminal convicted of tax evasion. Still, some believed it was a government PR ploy to showcase their new prison and justify its cost. Jonathan Egg, the author of Get Capone, the secret plot that captured America's most wanted gangster, suggests that sending Capone to Alcatraz was a way for the government to show off their new facility by housing the most notorious gangster in the country. Capone's arrival at Alcatraz marked a significant shift in his life. Gone were the days of luxury and privilege that he had enjoyed in Chicago's Cook County Jail, where he had a private cell, home-cooked meals, telephone privileges, and visits from his gangland pals. At Alcatraz, Capone was assigned to a typical 9 by 5 foot cell, just like any other inmate. He no longer received special treatment or privileges. The silk underwear, custom-tailored suits, and extra time on the tennis courts were a thing of the past. Capone was now subjected to the same kind of work as every other inmate, sweeping corridors, mopping floors, and doing laundry in the prison's laundry room. Despite his celebrity status, Capone's life in Alcatraz was far from glamorous. He was not exempt from the rules and regulations of the prison. However, it was noted by a fellow prisoner that Capone did not face the same beatings or dungeon punishments as others due to his political influence, and it was later exposed that his cell was very well furnished. Contrary to the stark and grim image typically associated with prison cells, Capone's living quarters were a stark departure from the norm. Philadelphia newspapers of the time were quick to note the lavish furnishings that adorned his cell, creating an atmosphere more reminiscent of a high-end hotel suite than a penitentiary. The first thing that catches our eye is the fine furniture that fills the space. A comfortable armchair, upholstered in rich leather, sits elegantly in one corner. Its polished wood frame exudes a sense of sophistication, a stark contrast to the cold, bare walls that typically define a prison cell. A small side table adorned with intricate carvings holds a delicate porcelain vase filled with fresh flowers, adding a touch of color and life to the otherwise confined space. Moving our gaze across the room, we are drawn to the beautiful rugs that cover the cold stone floor. These rugs, meticulously woven with intricate patterns and vibrant colors, provide a soft and luxurious surface underfoot. They not only add warmth to the cell, but also serve as a visual reminder of the stark contrast between Capone's surroundings and the harsh reality of prison life. As we continue to explore the cell, our attention is captured by the tasteful paintings that adorn the walls. These art works, carefully selected to enhance the ambiance of the space, depict serene landscapes and elegant portraits. Each brushstroke tells a story, transporting Capone to a world far removed from the confines of his prison cell. The paintings serve as a window to a different reality, offering a temporary escape from the harshness of his circumstances. But perhaps the most striking feature of Capone's cell is the presence of a fancy radio. Positioned prominently on a polished desk, the radio emits the strains of waltzes that fill the air. The powerful cabinet radio receiver, with its handsome design and fine finish provides a constant source of entertainment and solace for Capone during his time behind bars. The melodic tunes transport him to a world beyond the prison walls, offering a temporary respite from the harsh realities of his confinement. When news broke of Capone's cell containing fine furniture, beautiful rugs, tasteful paintings, and a fancy radio, it sparked public outrage and disbelief. Many questioned how a convicted criminal responsible for heinous crimes and violence could be living in such luxury while serving his sentence. The stark contrast between Capone 
own cell and the austere conditions endured by other inmates raised concerns about fairness and equality within the prison system. Critics argued that the lavishness of Capone's cell was a clear example of preferential treatment. They believed that his status as a high-profile gangster afforded him special privileges that were not extended to other prisoners. However, it is important to note that Capone's stay in Philadelphia's Eastern State Penitentiary was not without its challenges. He spent thousands of dollars in an attempt to secure his release, highlighting his desire to escape the confines of the prison. Capone vehemently denied throughout his life that he came to Philadelphia to hide, but the sensational facts surrounding his stay continue to captivate the public. Capone's desire to regain his freedom was evident from the moment he set foot in the Eastern State Penitentiary. He spent thousands of dollars on legal fees, bribes, and other means to secure his release. His wealth and connections allowed him to employ a team of lawyers and investigators who tirelessly worked to find any loophole or opportunity that could lead to his freedom. One of Capone's most audacious attempts to secure his release involved bribing prison officials. It was rumored that he offered substantial sums of money to those in positions of power, hoping to buy his way out of prison. While the exact details of these bribery attempts remain shrouded in secrecy, the fact that Capone was willing to go to such lengths demonstrates the extent of his desperation. Another tactic employed by Capone was to challenge the legality of his arrest and subsequent conviction. His legal team meticulously combed through the details of his case, searching for any procedural errors or constitutional violations that could be used to overturn his sentence. Capone's lawyers argued that his arrest outside the movie theater was unlawful and that the evidence against him was obtained through illegal means. However, despite their efforts, these legal challenges ultimately proved unsuccessful. Despite his relentless efforts, Capone's attempts to secure his release ultimately proved futile. While Al Capone may have been confined to a 9 by 5 foot cell in Alcatraz, his mind was free to explore new horizons. Capone, whose education had been cut short when he was expelled in the 7th grade, took this opportunity to catch up on his reading. He made frequent visits to the prison library, selecting books that reflected his interest in self-improvement and a desire to expand his knowledge. According to biographer Jonathan Aig, Capone's reading list included books on the proper use of English, music appreciation, and even flower gardening. It was clear that Capone was determined to make the most of his time in prison and engage in activities that would help him grow as an individual. One book in particular stood out among Capone's reading choices, Life Begins at 40 by Walter B. Pitkin. Published in 1932, this bestseller promised a brighter and more fulfilling life after the age of 40. For Capone, who was serving an 11-year sentence at the age of 36, this book may have provided a glimmer of hope and a vision for a better future. Capone's interest in reading extended beyond self-improvement. He also subscribed to a staggering 87 newspapers and magazines, according to Lawrence Burgreen's biography. This voracious reading habit allowed Capone to stay informed about the world outside the prison walls and maintain a connection to the outside. In addition to his interest in reading, Capone also developed a passion for music during his time in Alcatraz. He had the idea of starting a musical band with other inmates, and after lobbying the warden for a year, he was granted permission to form an ensemble. The band, known as the Rock Islanders, was allowed to practice for a maximum of 20 minutes a day. Capone chose the banjo as his instrument of choice despite having no prior musical experience. He patiently familiarized himself with the rudiments of music theory and eventually learned to decipher musical notation. Capone's dedication paid off, and he was able to pick out a few simple tunes on the banjo, softly singing along. Playing alongside Capone in the Alcatraz band was another prominent gangster, George Machine Gun Kelly, known for his virtuosity with a submachine gun. Together, they formed an unlikely musical duo, showcasing their talents and finding solace in the power of music. Capone's musical skills continued to grow, and he boasted to his son that he knew around 500 songs, particularly show tunes. He even wrote at least one song himself, a sentimental tribute to his long-suffering wife titled Madonna Mia. However, while Al Capone may have found solace in reading and music during his time in Alcatraz, his health was deteriorating. Capone had been suffering from syphilis, a sexually transmitted infection for years, and by the time he arrived at Alcatraz, the disease had taken a toll on his body and mind. Prison doctors were aware of Capone's condition and attempted to treat him with experimental methods. One such treatment involved injecting Capone with the malaria virus, a technique believed to raise his body temperature and potentially kill the syphilis bacteria. However, the treatment nearly proved fatal as Capone's body struggled to cope with the effects of the malaria virus. Despite the risks, a second attempt was made to treat Capone with the same method. Once again, the treatment pushed Capone to the brink of death. These experimental treatments were a desperate attempt to combat a disease that had gone untreated for years. As a result of the syphilis and the experimental treatments, Capone's health began to deteriorate rapidly. He experienced periods of lucidity, but also moments of delirium and unpredictable behavior. The once feared gangster became a shadow of his former self, battling the physical and mental effects of the disease. 
case, Capone's behavior became increasingly unpredictable, leading to concerns among the prison staff. His transformation from a model prisoner to a raging lunatic was a stark reminder of the devastating impact of syphilis on his mind and body. Despite his declining health, Capone's time in Alcatraz was coming to an end. After serving a total of four and a half years, he was transferred to Terminal Island Prison in Southern California for the remainder of his sentence. The experimental treatments had not cured him, and the disease continued to take its toll. Capone's release from Alcatraz in January 1939 marked the end of his time in federal prison, but it did not bring him back to his former gangland glory. He still had several months left on his sentence, which he served in federal prisons in Los Angeles and Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. After a brief stay in Baltimore for medical treatment, Capone returned to his estate on Palm Island near Miami. His days were spent fishing, playing cards, entertaining visitors, and slipping in and out of sanity. The once feared gangster had become a retired man, battling the effects of syphilis and the demons of his past. But to understand this, let me discuss the trial that shook the nation and made him end up in prison. Al Capone's Trial during his criminal career, Al Capone lived a life of luxury and excess. His extravagant spending and lavish lifestyle were the talk of the town, captivating both his admirers and his enemies. Capone's admissions during his trial shed light on his exorbitant spending habits. The prosecution presented evidence of his weekly expenses, which included $200 to $250 on meat in Miami, $3 to $4 a day on bread and cake, and a staggering $21,550 on furniture in 1925 alone. Capone spared no expense when it came to his wardrobe, spending $6,180 on suits in the same year. His taste for luxury extended to his social life as he splurged $3,160 on a Columbus Day party and $4,925 on a Kentucky Derby shindig, both in 1926. But that was just the tip of the iceberg. Capone's phone bill in Miami for 1929 totaled a jaw-dropping $3,141, equivalent to approximately $56,500 in today's currency. While he enjoyed the finer things in life, Capone also made significant contributions to his community. He sent $15,600 to his church in 1926 and donated $58,000 to a police and widows fund in 1925, showcasing a complex and contradictory character. One of the most shocking displays of Capone's wealth was his real estate ventures. He purchased an estate at Palm Island, Florida for a staggering $40,000, putting it in the name of his wife, May. Capone spared no expense in improving the property investing $100,000 in renovations, including a luxurious $4,000 swimming pool. His taste for luxury extended to his choice of automobiles as well. He forked over $12,500 for a specially built automobile, further cementing his reputation as a man of extravagant tastes. Capone's shopping sprees were legendary, with witnesses from Chicago's Marshall Field and Company department store testifying about his extravagant purchases. From 1927 to 1928, Capone went on a spree, spending a total of three $3,715 on 23 suits, three top coats, and an overcoat. He didn't stop there. He also spent over $1,300 on 35 tailored and monogrammed shirts. His love for accessories was evident when he bought 30 diamond encrusted gold belt buckles for his friends as Christmas gifts. Elmer Irie, head of the Treasury Department's intelligence unit, testified during the trial, shedding light on how his team built the tax evasion case against Capone. The details of Capone's extravagant spending played a crucial role in proving the extent of his income and the willful intent to defraud the government. The jury, composed of rural gentlemen with simple habits of dress, was astounded by the contrast between their own lives and Capone's opulent lifestyle. The revelations of Capone's lavish spending and extravagant lifestyle left the jury and the public in awe. It was clear that Capone's wealth was far beyond what anyone could have imagined. His extravagant purchases, luxurious properties, and extravagant parties painted a picture of a man who lived life to the fullest, regardless of the legality of his actions activities. However, the trial of Al Capone took an unexpected turn when a dramatic incident unfolded in the courtroom. It involved Capone's intimidating bodyguard, Phil D'Andrea, and the shocking discovery of a loaded gun. During the half-day Saturday hearing, as the prosecution was wrapping up its case, all eyes were suddenly drawn to a commotion in the courtroom. Federal tax agents swiftly grabbed and detained Phil D'Andrea, Capone's imposing bodyguard, who had been attending each hearing. The reason for his detention became apparent when Treasury agents
agent Mike Malone noticed the outline of a gun in D'Andrea's coat. The officers wasted no time in removing a loaded .38 caliber pistol and loose ammunition from D'Andrea's person. D'Andrea, in an attempt to defend himself, argued that he held a court bailiff permit for the weapon. However, it was revealed that his permit had recently expired, leading to his immediate arrest. Judge Wilkerson, taking the matter seriously, ordered D'Andrea to be jailed without bail, ensuring that he remained in custody throughout the trial. The discovery of the loaded gun on Capone's bodyguard hinted at the lengths to which Capone and his associates would go to protect their interests and maintain control over their illicit activities. Also, during the trial, witnesses from Chicago's renowned Marshall Field and Company department store took the stand, providing shocking details of Capone's extravagant purchases. From 1927 to 1928, Capone went on shopping sprees, spending a staggering $3,715 on 23 suits, three top coats, and an overcoat. He spared no expense when it came to his wardrobe, favoring monogrammed shirts that ranged from $18 to $27 each. His taste for luxury extended to accessories, as he spent $401, equivalent to over $7,200 in 2021, on neckties and handkerchiefs in 1927 alone. Witnesses also testified about Capone's preference for canary and green-colored furniture, showcasing his unique and extravagant taste. His love for luxury extended beyond personal items, as he purchased sterling silver dinner sets and even diamond-encrusted gold belt buckles as Christmas gifts for his friends. Also, Elmer Irie, the head of the Treasury Department's intelligence unit, played a crucial role in building the tax evasion case against Al Capone. During the trial, Irie took the stand and provided compelling testimony about the investigation into Capone's finances. He revealed that his unit began probing Capone's financial activities on October 18, 1928, marking the start of a relentless pursuit to uncover the truth behind Capone's illegal earnings. Fred Rees, the star witness for the prosecution, also played a crucial role in unraveling Al Capone's criminal empire during the trial. Rees, a former cash handler for Capone's gambling houses, provided compelling testimony that shed light on the inner workings of Capone's illicit operations. Rees testified about his role in writing cashier's checks to a fake name. J.C. Dunbar, which he then cashed for himself at a bank. These checks amounted to approximately $150,000, equivalent to the profits generated at Capone's Cicero gambling joints. The checks were received by Capone's henchman, Jake Guzik, further implicating Capone's involvement in the illegal activities. Rias's testimony also hinted at Capone's hidden hand in running the gambling dens. He revealed that Capone's brother, Ralph, was responsible for hiring the managers of the gambling clubs. Additionally, Rias testified that Guzik instructed him to hand over cash only to himself or the person he designated, explicitly excluding Capone from the process. While Rias provided valuable insights into the inner workings of Capone's criminal enterprise, he also admitted that he never witnessed Capone directly handling money or accepting wagers during his time at the gambling houses. Nevertheless, his testimony painted a picture of Capone's involvement in the operations through his trusted associates and the careful orchestration of financial transactions. The defense's case in Al Capone's trial took a different approach, aiming to challenge challenge the prosecution's evidence and create reasonable doubt. Their strategy centered around presenting witnesses who testified about Capone's significant losses in horse race betting, suggesting that these losses might excuse his tax bills. However, this defense strategy proved flawed, as deductions from losses are only permitted for taxes owed on winning wagers. The defense called several bookmakers to the stand, praising Capone as a reliable horse race better who risked substantial amounts of money on horses from 1924 to 1925. However, the witnesses revealed that Capone had a streak of bad luck, losing thousands of dollars in 1924 and 1925. Damon Runyon, a famous journalist, even quipped that Capone deserved the title of world's worst horse player, while the defense attempted to argue that Capone's gambling losses could explain his tax situation. Their argument lacked a solid foundation. The prosecution had already presented evidence of Capone's extravagant spending and unreported income, making the defense's strategy ineffective in challenging the charges of tax evasion. Ultimately, Ultimately, the defense's arguments failed to convince the jury. The overwhelming evidence presented by the prosecution, combined with Capone's extravagant lifestyle and unreported income, led to his conviction on three felonies and two misdemeanors. The defense's attempt to create reasonable doubt fell short, and Capone was sentenced to 11 years in federal prison. But who was Al Capone?
Al Capone, the notorious American gangster, was born on January 17, 1899 in Brooklyn, New York City. He was the fourth of nine children born to Italian immigrants Gabriel and Teresa Capone. Growing up in a working class neighborhood, Capone's family struggled to make ends meet. His father worked as a barber while his mother took care of the household. From a young age, Capone showed signs of being a troublemaker. He was expelled from school at the age of 14 for hitting a female teacher. With limited options for education, Capone turned to the streets and quickly became involved in criminal activities. He joined the Five Points Gang, a notorious street gang known for their involvement in theft, extortion, and other illegal activities. Under the guidance of gang leader Johnny Torrio, Capone learned the ropes of the criminal underworld. Torrio recognized Capone's potential and took him under his wing, teaching him the art of bootlegging and gambling. Capone proved to be a quick learner and soon became a trusted associate of Torrio. In 1920, the United States implemented the Prohibition, banning the production, sale, and distribution of alcoholic beverages. This marked a turning point in Capone's criminal career. He saw an opportunity to capitalize on the demand for alcohol and quickly established himself as a prominent figure in the illegal liquor trade. Capone's rise to power was not without its challenges. He faced fierce competition from rival gangs, particularly the North Side gang led by George Bugs Moran. The rivalry between Capone and Moran escalated into a violent conflict, with both sides engaging in brutal acts of violence to gain control over the lucrative bootlegging business. Capone's involvement with the Five Points gang and his rise to power in the Chicago underworld caught the attention of law enforcement. He became a target for federal authorities, who were determined to bring him down. However, Capone was known for his ability to evade capture and maintain a network of corrupt officials who protected him. Despite his criminal activities, Capone was also known for his charisma and charm. He had a knack for public relations and often portrayed himself as a generous benefactor. During the height of the Great Depression, Capone opened soup kitchens to provide meals for the unemployed, earning him the reputation of a modern-day Robin hood among some members of the community. With his rise to power in the Chicago outfit, Al Capone became one of the most influential and feared gangsters of his time. Under his leadership, the criminal organization expanded its operations and solidified its control over the city's underworld. Capone's control over the Chicago outfit was marked by a series of violent confrontations with rival gangs, most notably the Northside Gang led by George Bugs Moran. The conflict between the two gangs reached its peak on February 14, 1929, in what would become known as the infamous St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Capone's men, disguised as police officers, brutally gunned down seven members of the North Side Gang in a garage on Chicago's North Side. The massacre shocked the nation and further cemented Capone's reputation as a ruthless and dangerous criminal. One of Capone's key sources of power and wealth was his control over the bootlegging business. With the prohibition in full swing, the demand for illegal alcohol skyrocketed, and Capone was quick to capitalize on this opportunity. He established a vast network of speakeasies, breweries, and distilleries, ensuring a steady supply of alcohol to meet the growing demand. To protect his bootlegging operations, Capone employed a combination of bribery, intimidation, and violence. He had influential figures in law enforcement and politics on his payroll, ensuring that his illegal activities went undisturbed. Those who dared to challenge Capone or interfere with his operations often met a violent and untimely end. Capone's bootlegging empire extended beyond Chicago. He had connections with other criminal organizations across the country, allowing him to distribute his illegal alcohol to major cities such as New York, Detroit, and Philadelphia. His reach and influence were far-reaching, making him a force to be reckoned with in the criminal underworld. The immense wealth generated from the bootlegging business allowed Capone to indulge in a lavish and extravagant lifestyle. He was known for his custom-made suits, expensive jewelry, and luxurious cars. Capone's opulent lifestyle and flamboyant personality made him a celebrity of sorts, capturing the attention of the media and the public. Al Capone was not only known for his criminal activities, but also for his his flamboyant lifestyle and involvement in the jazz scene. Despite his violent reputation, Capone had a taste for the finer things in life and was often seen in custom-made suits adorned with expensive jewelry. Capone's extravagant lifestyle extended beyond his personal appearance. He owned luxurious homes, including a mansion in Miami Beach known as Capone's Castle, complete with a swimming pool, palm trees, and a private beach. His cars were also a reflection of his opulence, with customized features and bulletproof windows. In addition to his lavish lifestyle, Capone had a deep appreciation for music. He was particularly drawn to jazz, a genre that was gaining popularity during the 1920s and 1930s. Capone frequented jazz clubs and speakeasies where he would enjoy performances by renowned musicians of the time. But despite his criminal activities, Capone was not invincible. The federal authorities were determined to bring him down, and they found a way to do so through an unexpected avenue, tax evasion. In 1931, Capone was charged with income tax evasion, and after a highly publicized trial, he was convicted and sentenced to 11 years 
years in federal prison. Capone's conviction and imprisonment marked a turning point in his criminal career. The Chicago outfit continued to operate under the leadership of Frank Nitti, but its power and influence were significantly reduced. Prohibition was eventually repealed in 1933, further diminishing the profitability of the bootlegging business. Capone's time in prison was not without its challenges. He faced threats from fellow inmates who saw him as a high-profile target. To ensure his safety, Capone was transferred to the newly opened Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary in 1934. Located on an island off the coast of San Francisco, Alcatraz was known for its strict security measures and reputation as a place to house the most dangerous criminals. During his incarceration, Capone's health began to deteriorate. He showed signs of neurosyphilis, a late-stage complication of syphilis that affects the nervous system. The disease caused physical and mental decline, further impacting Capone's ability to maintain control over the Chicago outfit. Of course, the Chicago outfit, under the leadership of Frank Nitti, continued to operate during Capone's imprisonment. However, the organization's power and influence were significantly reduced. With the repeal of Prohibition in 1933, the focus of organized crime in Chicago shifted to other illegal activities such as prostitution and labor union racketeering. Capone's absence allowed rival gangs to gain a foothold in the city, challenging the Chicago outfit's dominance. The criminal landscape was changing, and the once feared Capone was no longer at the forefront of the illicit activities in Chicago. In 1939, after serving nearly eight years of his sentence, Capone was released on parole due to his deteriorating mental and physical condition. He returned to his family in Florida but lived a quiet and secluded life. The once powerful gangster was a shadow of his former self, no longer able to exert the same level of control and influence. Still, the public's fascination with Capone's lifestyle and persona extended beyond his lifetime. His image as a larger-than-life gangster has been immortalized in books, movies, and popular culture. Films such as Scarface and The Untouchables have portrayed Capone as a charismatic and ruthless figure, further fueling the public's fascination with his life and crimes. Capone's influence on pop culture can also be seen in the music industry. Numerous songs have been written about him, capturing the essence of his reign as a gangster. Artists such as Jay-Z, Eminem, and Rihanna have referenced Capone in their lyrics, further cementing his place in popular culture. Despite his notoriety, Capone's criminal empire eventually crumbled, and he was left with a tarnished legacy. But Capone's rise to power, his involvement in the illegal alcohol trade, and his lasting legacy as a larger-than-life figure have solidified his place as one of the most notorious and iconic figures in American history. Thank you for joining us today. Click on the videos on your screen for similar content.